Well, thanks to everybody um, online and in the room for coming to this. So this paper is the result of a collaboration with uh, economists at the Bank of Italy. Um, it's a lot of work involved because the data problems were quite serious. Uh, historical data had to be spliced and matched with more recent data and anyway, a lot of work. But it fits with uh, a program that I've had for many years. Sorry, there's no sound too. coming through. Oh, is that David Yagoda? Can you hear us? I don't know what's happening there because we tested this before. Let's try Yagoda. Oh, she did. Okay, that's fine. Dave, David? I think that must be a problem at David's end then, if Yagoda can hear us, is what we might see. Sorry. Yes, good. Thank you, Yagoda. Anyway, as I was saying, it fits with a long-term research program to try to improve policy models. So we know that the new Keynes and DSG models um, really failed terribly to capture the financial accelerator and finance really can't be linkages. But uh, the semi-structural models that uh, many central banks, most central banks now have to replace their previous DSG models um, are also quite defective. Um, and so that this has implications both for capturing monetary transmission and for setting macroprudential policy. Now, this paper is about consumption, uh, and consumption is an important part, an important locus of the household finance sector um, interaction, transmission. So the standard policy models in, that have consumption functions, aggregate consumption functions in them, which they all do, um, they exclude varying credit conditions, and typically they aggregate all assets uh, into financial or total net worth, in other words, all assets minus debt, to capture the household portfolio. Either they exclude housing altogether or they make very inappropriate assumptions about, about housing. Moreover, they emit, many models emit permanent income or don't handle it very well. So one question is, why pick on Italy to, uh, to, to study consumption? I'll explain. Okay. So there's been there's been a bit of a revolution in, in macro. So the the micro and the macro evidence has strongly rejected representative agent rational tables life cycle model of households that operate without liquidity and credit constraints. Hedrigenius research on, on agents in a context of incomplete markets has changed the theoretical foundations. And there's now a lot of evidence on the cash flow channel of transmission of monetary policy, particularly in economies where there are floating interest rates, like in the UK, you know, in the UK, uh, much of the talk, the negative effects of consumption of those people who are heavily in debt, whose mortgages um, are resetting. So most central banks have realized the need to, to go for semi-structural models, more flexible models where the data can speak, uh, can speak better. So unfortunately, these models, net worth is the only way that asset prices, liquidity, and credit shocks affect consumption. Um, they ignore liquidity differences, despite quite a large literature on money, with easier money, well, the idea is that you weight the different types of money um, by how different their interest rates are uh, relative to zero, because the higher the interest rate, the less liquid that type of money typically is. Um, so the idea of, of weighting um, different types of money differently because of liquidity is, 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 you know, is deep in the profession. 
And yet, central banks have not taken that lesson and more widely to look at portfolios. These models trivialize the role of debt relative to housing and stock market wealth, and they ignore shifts in credit constraints, so they miss what me and the Sufi called the credit-driven household demand channel. And they haven't got good stories for debt, house prices, and residential construction. And as a result, they can't explain the financial accelerator and also how different, different countries respond to these kinds of shocks. And they also miss major channels of monetary transmission. So on housing and consumption, the micro-research has been showing that the main housing wealth effect is more of a collateral effect than a classical wealth effect. So it's countries with home equity withdrawal options where housing wealth really matters. And it implies the housing wealth should be treated differently from other assets, quite apart from good neoclassical reasons for doing that. And when you think about the collateral role, it should be time bearing because it depends on how easy it is to refinance your mortgage. If you try to use equity withdrawal, you know, and, and sometimes it's very easy to refinance, other times it's not. So that time variation is an important part of the story. Now, where home equity withdrawal is difficult and credit constraints are tight, and says that the down payment constraint that that uh, the regulators and the banks demand from households, uh, if they are large, it's actually possible for higher house prices, other things being equal, to actually reduce aggregate consumption, which is the opposite of the, the conventional um, US American, US UK kind of assumption. So I've been arguing for a long time that we need a household um, housing system uh, where the consumption portfolio, asset price, housing investment um, is modeled jointly. And um, we produced some papers on these lines uh, for France, for example. Uh, now, Janine and I are just working on South Africa um, to estimate a system of this exact this kind. So we need, at the very least, an equation for consumption, for non-mortgage debt, for mortgage debt, for liquid assets, for house prices, and for permanent income. And then add it to that, um, housing investment, and in principle, it would be nice to include the drivers of illiquid financial assets, but that's the stock market, and that's a complex story that doesn't depend so much on, on households. So for some countries, we found that it's actually impossible to make, to tell a coherent story about any of these things without taking credit conditions into account, and that's very much the case for, for France and South Africa. Now, why Italy? Well, Italy is different. Italy has very low levels of mortgage debt relative to national income. And it's had quite modest and gradual rises in debt over time. And that makes it possible to study the balance sheet effects on consumption of different kinds of financial assets and debt uh, without the complication of having to take this complex system with credit conditions varying hugely into account. So in other words, what I'm saying is that for France, the US, the UK, uh, South Africa, it's impossible to tell a coherent story about consumption without taking credit conditions into account. For Italy, it turns out that you can. So it turns out that credit conditions only have um, a short-term effect. They don't affect the long-run solution for consumption. And as a result, you can get a very nice, get a very nice understanding of how the different liquidities or financial assets um, affect consumption. Now, why is it that Italy is different in this way? Well, for quite a few reasons. The innovation legal system in Italy, where banks trying to access collateral, um, you know, a mortgage that's collateralized in a house. Uh, might face six years of delays in actually getting hold of the house because the legal system is so cumbersome and so slow. The law is also very favorable to tenants and borrowers and not to landlords and creditors. And of course, the culture has adapted to this. So the kind of cultural pattern is for young adults to stay long in their parents' home. But as a result, when you get the data, 
uh, the first two clients in Italy, apart from those inheriting from their grandparents, um, are older than most other European countries. So just to show how different Italy is, this is Italy. This is the mortgage debt to income ratio. Um, here's Ireland. This is the Netherlands, Spain. So Italy really is quite different. So I'm going to show you some data on Italy so you get a sort of an idea of the key facts. So in Italy, the, the, the saving ratio, or one minus the saving ratio, actually, the ratio of consumption of total disposable income. So between 1990 and about 2000, there was this massive rise in the ratio of consumption to total disposable income, um, and therefore a fall in the saving ratio. And then it's fluctuated a bit. COVID, of course, had massive short-run effects. So one of the uh, key aspects of, of the model is to try to explain why this happened. Now, in many countries, what was going on here for a similar rise in the consumption income ratio was credit liberalization and a credit boom, not in Italy. Now, we don't use conventional disposable income, we use scaled income, which gives uh, non-property income a higher weight, which is consistent with economic, economic theory. Um, there's a lot of evidence that the marginal propensity to, to, to spare it out as labor income is higher than it is out of property income. Um, but you know, the overall pattern uh, for scaled income is, is, is fairly similar. So here's some data on, on on household deposits. Liquid deposits have behaved like this. Debt has gone up quite gradually. In the UK, to contrast, um, in this period here, debt exceeded liquid assets by some margin, and in Ireland by a huge margin. So in other countries, the picture looks very, very different. Um, the, the, the net asset position um, net liquid asset position has remained very positive in in uh, Italy compared to other countries. So let me turn to the key elements of the portfolio that we have data on. Italy is one of those countries that's quite unusual in that households actually own uh, a lot of government bonds and corporate bonds. Um, in the UK, direct ownership of bonds um, would be on a much smaller, much smaller level. So you can see that in this period, 90 to 2000, there were, was a big increase in, um, in, bond, uh, in, in the value of bonds and, and volume of bonds, and also mutual funds. So they both rose very sharply in this period. And it turns out that that is really quite an important clue to, to what's going on. This is housing wealth relative to, to income. Um, in Italy, Housing wealth, actually, when you look at the total portfolio, housing wealth dominates um, the, the other elements of the household portfolio. Pensions and unquoted shares. Pensions is the green line, unquoted shares the, the right one. And this is what happened to housing affordability, namely the ratio of house prices to, to income. So when we look at this period here, 90 to 2000, quite a different pattern from any of the Anglo-Saxon countries. Um, so in, in, in the UK, um, in Canada, in, in the US, over this period, there was a huge rise in house prices relative to income. In Italy, there was actually, actually a fall. And yet this is the period where the consumption of income ratio is shooting up. So you know, it's a totally different situation from that of the Anglo-Saxon countries. So in the end, we aggregate assets into sort of convenient groups, and we have net liquid assets, which is liquid assets minus debt, um, semi-liquid assets, which is uh, the, uh, the green line, sorry, and illiquid assets, which is the black line. And then we're going to try to tease out the market density side of these different elements. So just to backtrack, how, how does one estimate, how do one think about consumption? Well, 
I'm very much um, in line with, with David Henry on, on this. Theory-based models make simplifying assumptions. We generally don't know which of those assumptions are correct and how one deduces the right model based on those assumptions. So for applied work, it's a good idea to, to start with an encompassing approach uh, with a, a, a model that's more general than the, the simple model that theory throws up, but encompasses or nests rival models. So each of the special cases by imposing parameter restrictions can be thought of as a special case of a, of a general model. This is something that David and his authors, his co-authors, have, have written about for, for a long time. So the simple textbook model um, looks like this in, in, um, in log approximate, approximate form. So it says the log of the consumption to current income ratio can be written in terms of the permanent income to current income and asset, assets to income, total assets, where the theory pretends that, that net worth is liquid and no credit constraints, no issues of that kind. So what we're going to do is to generalize that by splitting the network into its key elements each with a different coefficient, which reflects a very elementary notion, which is that cash, for example, is more spendable than your pension. You know, cash and the bank or in your hand is obviously more spendable than the pension. So it's absurd to aggregate them all into net worth. We're going to allow the coefficient on permanent income, which is one here, allow that to, to be different from one and also apply discount rates to future income, which are far higher than the conventional tax population, because after all, um, the future is very uncertain, and people discount the future more heavily if the greater is uncertain. Um, we allow the, potentially, the intercept to vary with credit conditions, although in the case of Italy, it turns out, it turns out not to be that important. Um, and in principle, we need to test for the time variation in the, in the hazard collateral effect and the, the down payment constraint. Because with, if there were financial liberalization, those constraints would shift and therefore would affect, um, would affect the coefficients on those, on those components of the model. And then equilibrium correction, of course. So the encompassing model looks like this. So as I said, um, in, in principle, sorry, in principle, the intercept term could be time bearing with credit conditions. Here we allow um, the borrowing rate and the, and the deposit rate both to be in there. Um, this is permanent income to current income, potentially time bearing because liberalization might make you more forward looking. Net liquid assets, illiquid financial assets, housing wealth. And then the offsetting effect of, house, of housing affordability, and then possibly demography effects. And for Italy, we distinguish, in addition to illiquid financial assets, semi liquid assets. So that's an extra feature of the model. So just think about signs. For people who own property, an increase in housing wealth relative to income. Is positive for their, for, their, for their spending. For people who aim to be homeowners or renters, an increase in house prices relative to their income makes housing less affordable. They have to save more. So you've got these two offsetting effects from different groups in the population. And it's important to take both into account. Um, so the short run dynamics, income uncertainty is proxied by the Changing the unemployment rate, something I found in just about every country I've ever done this for. And income volatility turns out to be relevant as well. And well, it's important to test for change in the nominal interest rate. In the UK, the change in the nominal interest rate would be an important part of the transmission mechanism um, because of the cash flow constraint on, on borrowers. In Italy, because debt is, sorry. How do you take permanent income? Yeah. I'll, I'll come to that. Yeah, that's a very important question. Um, 
So let me just say something about, about the theory and how this more general model actually explains what's consistent with modern molecular evidence. So this very important paper by Crawley and Kuchler just come out in the AER macro uh, journal, um, looks at microdata for Denmark. And uh, they show that the marginal density to consume um, varies greatly across households, and it depends very much on the asset position of the household. So the MPC is highest for the asset poor, it's immediate for, the, for those holding illiquid but not liquid assets, and lowest for the doubly asset rich, those who own both liquid and illiquid financial assets. And the encompassing model um, actually is very consistent with that, because if you think about the marginal propensity to consume, um, it depends on, on these different um, wealth to income ratios. And you can show, because this coefficient is typically a lot bigger than that, and bigger than that, you can show that people who have um, a lot of liquidity will have a particularly low um, marginal density to spend. Um, anyway, a long story, but it's, but it's very consistent with the, with the microeconomics and the heterogeneous agent view uh, and the microevidence of the heterogeneous agent view. So let me turn to your question about Bernard Lee. So how do conventional models, when they include permanent income, which many models don't, um, how do they handle permanent income? Well, the frivolous model, which is the US Federal Reserve semi structural model, has two versions of permanent income. They've got a model consistent version of future income expectations and one based on an auxiliary, a small VAR um, to, to, drive, to drive income. And they find that actually the model consistent version works very badly and the VAR uh, works rather better. But these approaches don't handle structural breaks terribly well. Now, you know, I bet you there wasn't a single Italian household um, that foresaw the global financial crisis and the subsequent European sovereign debt crisis. Um, so how does one handle that? You can't just blindly run a VAR that ignores the fact there's a huge structural break in the data. Uh, you need to do something about that. So what we do is try, try to replicate what and the competition might have done. And the competition obviously would have made the same, the same forecasting mistake before the crisis, but after the crisis, they would have adjusted the model to incorporate the structural break. So we have a, a model that incorporates the structural break, but then to back out what the explanation would have been beforehand, we have to remove the expectation of, of the, the break that came later that couldn't have been anticipated. So we have to correct. Uh, the fitted model for the fact that these crises were unforeseen. So, our permanent income model has a horizon of 40 quarters, 10 years. It's got a discount rate of 5% per quarter, that is about 20% per year, quite high discount of the future. And then we assume a learning process that happens once the crisis occurs. Um, people start learning about, about the crisis and they adapt their expectation of, of future income. They shift down their expectation of future income, um, but it, it's not always an instantaneous process. So, and we make some sensible assumptions about that. So in terms of the, yeah. That's a good question. There's also a big change in the Italian political system and economic management in the Libya series in the 90s, right? And also the adoption of the euro. Yeah. Do you, do you treat these things as structural breaks or increasing household uncertainty? Yeah, the, the, um, the, the early 90s, um, well, Italy was forced out of the ERM in, in 92, uh, along with, with the UK. And there's quite a major shock that happens around that time uh, and the political crisis as well. Um, we don't, we handled that essentially through, through a dummy rather than by trying to build into the income expectation process. Because what happens is it's a temporary phenomenon and then growth kind of resumed. Um, and if you wanted to, 
set of complicated kind of learning apparatus for a relatively short, uh, a short time break is just not worth it. It's better to use, use a dummy to, to handle that particular one. Um, as far as 2000 is concerned, I think you're, you're right. Because obviously the accession to the Eurozone had a huge effect on interest rates and uh, on expectations generally, on asset prices, and that's in the model. So, you know, the fact that we, we have these big gains in the stock market and uh, a lower interest rate, big gains in, in, in the value of bonds, that, that's, that's exactly what's in the model. In terms of the drivers of permanent income, uh, one of the most important components of that is the log ratio of the working age population to the total population. So I think all in per capita terms. When you think about it, if the working population were to shrink relative to the total population, um, that means the available income for, for the total population per capita um, is going to shrink, other things being equal. So that's changes in the working age population relative to the total population. It's an important part of the the general dynamics of, of, of permanent income. And then there are time trends, and obviously a post-GFC post, uh, trend shift. There's both a shift in the, in the slope and a shift in the level um, that's incorporated. It's national competitiveness, the unemployment rate, oil prices, the stock market, all of these things, and then some short-run effects. are in this reduced form of forecasting model. And this is what estimated permanent income um, and actual permanent income defined in the 40 year horizon uh, looks like. So the black line is the log of actual permanent income, um, taking future income over the next 40 quarters into account. Um, the fitted line is the one that incorporates the, the dotted line, the red line is the one that incorporates the structural break that couldn't have been anticipated. And then this shows the, the learning adjusted red line shows that just before the crisis, households were over optimistic about permanent income find about three and a half percent. So they overestimated future income growth, or future level of permanent income by about three and a half percent. And then they gradually um, learned and by 2012, quarter two, the assumption is they fully learned that new circumstances uh, applied. So that's how we do it. What about credit conditions? Um, my co-authors managed to dig out some interesting information from the Italian Central Credit Register, which is a measure of, of overall credit conditions, not for households, but overall. And it's um, the ratio of granted credit lines to used credit lines, and then we can do also look at the ratio of granted credit lines to a moving average of GDP. And that suggests that, yes, um, you know, I mean, comparing 90 with 2000, you can see there was a, a fall in credit conditions and then a rise. So not much change. Um, but then later on in the 2000s, um, for the liberalization, then of course a big contraction in credit conditions after the crisis. So it seems like a plausible indicator, but as I say, it has no longer an effect on the model, it's only the short run dynamics that it, that it uh, comes out. Let me say a word about, about the speed of adjustment, because misspecification and speed of adjustment um, are very closely connected. And not all economists understand that. I know that Jenny does. Uh, and David, of course. But, um, you know, I was trying to explain this at, at a seminar at the Bank of France a couple of years ago uh, to the people who actually construct the Bank of France model. And they completely failed to understand the point. Uh, that is, anyway, low speeds of adjustment in, a, in an ECM context including correction context, or a typical certain of specification problems. Um, and the Phillips curve is a great example. So the Phillips curve effectively takes the second difference of the log price level, the forward second difference of the log price level. So this high degree of difference makes non-stationary data 
or data that's subject to, to, to shifts look stationary. Um, in fact, inflation is, uh, it isn't only structural shifts, it's also long-term um, long trends, uh, relative price trends that affect inflation. And those are missing in the new Keynesian Phillips curve. And so, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, another great example from the ESG literature is this paper by Leeper, published in the AER, no less, uh, which is the model excludes credit, asset prices, shifts in credit constraints, other regime shifts, leaves out oil prices, and, you know, what you get. But what you get is a model that's, again, pushed towards second difference. So it's driven by the order equation for consumption, which incorporates habits. And the habit parameter is close to one, which means that the order equation basically takes the first difference of consumption with habits close to one. It's like the second difference of consumption. So it has to do that to eliminate all the things that have been left out. Uh, and so, of course, it reduces complete nonsense. It finally implies that households don't get utility from consumption. They get utility from the change in consumption. If you believe that, you believe anything. Um, okay, so let me turn to uh, the Italian estimates because they illustrate um, this general point that a misspecified model uh, typically results in very low speeds of adjustment. Having a well specified model then increases the speed of adjustment. So, what's going on in this first column is that uh, the driver of consumption, as far as the portfolio is concerned, is just net worth, or actually the log of net worth relative to income. And the speed of adjustment is 0.05. So, you know, it's saying that, that over a period of a year, only about a quarter, the end of four, four quarters, only about a quarter, of the year, less than a quarter of the adjustment is taking place. If you include the change in credit conditions, it just goes up a little bit, slightly improved model. Um, if you have the ratio of net worth as opposed to log is even worse. Then if you improve the model by incorporating, by splitting, wealth into financial wealth and housing. And you include this housing this housing affordability effect. Well, it's quite a big improvement. You know, it doubles the speed of adjustment to, to 10%. So that says that after a year, you know, about 45% of the adjustment has taken place. But the biggest improvement comes when you split Liquid when you split financial assets into liquid, semi liquid, and illiquid. And then the speed of adjustment jumps to 0.28. And if you include one, one further small improvement, which is to allow um, the post, post GFC role of the permanent income to, to shift a little bit, um, it rises to 0.29. So with 0 0.29, 0 0.28, um, well, about 70% of the adjustment, um, more than that, 80% um, of the adjustment takes place uh, after four quarters. So it's radically different from, from a number like that. But the bank basically model itself has a speed of adjustment, the consumption function, and speed of adjustment of 0.07. Um, so our approach, is saying something radically different about the speed to which consumption reacts to shocks and shifts in portfolio portfolios. So what kind of estimates do we get? Well, uh, let's take column five. So that's the model that's got the three-way split of financial assets. It's got um, housing wealth and it's got affordability. And you can see that the marginal propensity out of net liquid assets is about 0 0.015, 0 0.016, uh, 0 0.012 out of semi-liquid assets, 0 0.06 out of illiquid assets. We're actually, unquote, shares have been removed entirely because they, uh, 
and not at all significant. Um, and then housing wealth, wealth density is around 0.04, but it's offset very substantially by the negative effect of, of affordability. So the story about housing is complex and interesting. The Bank of Italy model just drops housing altogether. Um, and in a way, you can see why that is, because these two things offset each other. You know, housing wealth and house prices run through income um, go in the opposite direction. And so it seems to net out to zero. Um, so that, that's what's in their model. But actually, when you think about it, um, truth is quite different. So in the paper, uh, we've got a table that shows parameter stability, estimates the sample over different periods. Um, one comment about one of the controls in the paper uh, is for the, the pension reform. So in 2012, I uh, responded to your point about, about including uh, about politics. So at the end of the, the sovereign debt crisis, Italy was in, you know, under severe pressure to, to reform. Um, and one of the reforms that was, that was brought in, a very serious reform, first really a serious reform of the pension system was in 2012. And there's, there's some multiple evidence that examined the impact on the labor market, on, uh, on other aspects of, of behavior, um, suggesting that it had quite serious consequences. Now, the, the table one um, suggests that, that uh, it resulted in a long-term 4.9% fall in the consumption to income ratio, which is a bit, I think, a bit impossibly high. So one of the things that we, we looked at was, are there other things going on? Are there long-term trends that have been left out? And one of the possibilities is demography. And you can get a slight demographic effect. It's not significant, but it does have an impact on, on the estimate of this pension reform. And it's possible that, that the relative price of durables um, might also be part of the story. So the reasoning here is that, is that over time, um, consumption has, has moved quite a long way away from, from real objects um, into, you know, into, into the internet, um, into accessing um, films and, and music and so on um, very cheaply um, in a way that wasn't possible before. So one can argue that, that as technology which is quite well proxied by the relative price of durable. Durable goods have fallen in relative price to non-durables fairly systematically over time. That technological change has shifted consumption away from real things that you need to save up for to things that you don't have to save up for, and therefore might have, a, might have had an impact on the, on the consumption to income ratio. It, it's a possibility. Anyway, it, you know, it's, it's a marginal effect, but it does result in more sensible um, estimates of the pension effect. effect. Um, amazingly enough, the short run controls, the three impulse dummies, four um, income growth, lagged income volatility, the change beyond plummet rate, the change in public consumption, short term effects. When you leave them all out, it has almost no impact on the lower end solution. Um, which is pretty important and impressive because when referees on paper like this will say, oh, you filled the data, you put in so many, so many special things that you can't really believe the results. Need them all now, the bulk run changed. Um, estimates are robust to estimating current income. And he might have thought, well, an alternative asset grouping would be worth looking at. Let's suppose we aggregate semi-liquid defined by bills, bonds, quoted shares, mutual funds. Let's suppose illiquid assets are unquoted shares and pensions. Well, with that split, look at slightly worse fit, slower speed of adjustment, but the story about liquid assets, debt, and housing is completely unchanged. So it's robust. So let me go back to heterogeneity because I'm arguing at the beginning that the story of heterogeneous agents 
is, is the big change that's happened in macro that's changed, that's transformed the way we think about, about monetary transmission. Um, so I've argued the aggregate model is consistent with this model, modern heterogeneization in complete markets view. Um, What's it interesting to note that when you, the kind of data we're using she has a lot of distributional information in it. And instead of that being a negative, something that makes aggregation more difficult and makes the representative agent more implausible, well, I actually think of it as exactly the opposite. Um, by disaggregating assets uh, in this way, and also incorporating effective unemployment, uh, you'll capture some of the heterogeneity that's, 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 that's in the system. Um, So on um, the incidence of unemployment, the ownership of different assets and debt is very heterogeneous. And you can see that. So even, th this is data from the, from the, the, the survey, the, the wealth, income and wealth survey. So even for household deposits, um, look at the income quintile. 50, more than 50% of household de liquid deposits are owned by the, by the wealthiest quintile. But the other assets, it's, it's even higher. Um, you know, equities, managed investment schemes, and so on, even higher. So there's a huge amount of inequality and heterogeneity in that underlies the, the, the portfolio data the portfolio that we're looking at. Yes. And I would add to this that also in Italy, in Italian service, all these, uh, these figures are very important in terms of financial wealth. So, I mean, probably to do well, this. Well, my next point. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah. Um, part of the interest of comparing 2016 to 2020 is to see whether post COVID, this is post COVID, well, sort of late. 2020 is, the, is December 2020, so at the end of the first year of COVID. And obviously, there was a big, a big boost in what's called excess saving over this period. And it's interesting to think well, who held the, the additional saving? Was it the wealthiest or was it kind of fairly? Equally distributed across the population, and you know, actually, when you look at it, it it's quite ambiguous. It's not obvious that it's all the highest income households that had had the biggest increase in in their wealth holdings. But responding to your point, uh, even for deposits, the twenty sixteen survey um, only captures thirty five. The total deposits that come from the survey only captures thirty five percent. And what the aggregate balance sheet is showing uh, for deposits. So, you know, my worry is that yes, this distributional information is very nice, but it may be actually completely misleading about what's been happening to the underlying distribution because the underreporting is so curious. Okay, almost uh, at the end. Let me say a few words about how one thinks of these marginal propensities. So they incorporate the intrinsic aspect of liquidity, transactions cost of price uncertainty, but they also incorporate behavioral differences of distinct owner types, lower NPCs for the more affluent. And so when, if the average NPC for deposits at you know, around 15%, um, it's almost certain to be much higher than that for those for the asset poor and lower than that for the asset rich. So in other words, what we're estimating is a magnitude effect and the distribution, there's a lot of distributional stuff underneath it that we don't know about. So this, this literature on, on, uh, on excess saving. So this paper by Ballestini shows that in the US, um, the, the surge in, in saving during the pandemic, mostly in liquid assets. In the euro area, much of it went to illiquid or less liquid assets. And I've got some estimates of implications. I think for Italy, the implications wouldn't be very good because they ignore the fact that actually what they call illiquid assets also includes semi-liquid assets, which have very different behavioral consequences from, from uh, the most illiquid assets. So aggregating illiquid assets into one lump actually isn't very good. So finally, what do I conclude? One of the amazing things is that, you know, the completely no brainer insight that everybody I've had respect to thinks it's obvious 
that liquid assets are more spendable than pension wealth. I don't, I've not found a single central bank model that incorporates that simple idea, not one. Why? Well, it's the micro foundations ideology of the rational expectations representative household um, with the single liquid assets in a world without asymmetric information, credit or liquidity. Because that gives you attractive optimization problem. You know, something you can solve with a solved out solution that's simple. Uh, so that's, that's what the models work with. Um, and the other stupidity is even the intertemporal neoclassical model says that housing wealth is different from financial wealth because housing is a consumption good, whereas financial assets are not directly consumed. And so you should never aggregate housing wealth with financial wealth. And yet most of the models actually lump housing wealth in, in net worth. So our finding is that summarizing household wealth in wealth portfolios by net worth is a disaster with modeling consumption. Um, the Bank of Italy consumption function, uh, so the speed of just from the point of sale, um, compared with ours. Um, so in a very distorted picture of the speed, also the incidence of uh, monetary transmission. I mean, our model would say, well, actually there are important long-term or medium-term consequences that feed through from the portfolio position of households um, House prices are important, but you've got to take into account the fact that they have these, this, this by time, a different effect for, for borrowers um, or potential um, potential um, owners of, of housing, people who are saving for a deposit or renters than, than for owners. Um, and debt is actually much more negative the effect of debt on consumption, other things being equal, is more negative than the financial models would, would tell you. And so when you think about money transmission, you've got to think about these medium and long-term consequences um, as well through the portfolio position, as well as the direct effect of interest rates on, on consumption. So that's that's the end of the story, but you know, handling housing correctly, um, splitting financial assets, is really key to getting good models and models that help you understand what's going on, help you um, understand money transmission and help it with, with financial stability issues. Because you know, if there is a housing story to the financial stability problem that the country faces or the banks face, then it's important to have a coherent story of, of how that works. So let me stop there. Questions, comments. Oh, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, just wondering what do you think the policy implications would be, um, given that Italy has a very different structure uh, to other European countries yeah. in terms of. Um, control of the uh, monetary policy and what other policy options you think it should undertake given your evidence of the model. Yeah, that's of course it back in 1998, yeah. Um I wrote a paper with some colleagues about um, about the coming monetary union and worrying about the asymmet the asymmetries between countries. Um but the institutional asymmetries um, that were there, and it was the labor market asymmetries and the different uh, histories, inflation histories, and so on, um, and worried monetary union between countries with such very different um, structures could could result in, in very serious problems. And um, I remember uh, right about that time, um, a whole bunch of treasury. UK Treasury economists descended on Nuffield um, and they wanted to discuss the, the, the five economic tests because at the time um, that the government, uh, the, the Labour government at the time, was um, considering whether to join the euro or not. And they proposed five economic tests that had to be satisfied um, uh, for entry conditions. And of course, I argued that for the UK it would be a complete disaster unless we radically transformed. Uh, our financial system and uh, a whole bunch of other things, um, because 
I said, well, what happened to Ireland subsequently? Uh, I was afraid that that would happen in the UK. We would have an explosion of, of house prices and debt um, going out of control and then the financial crisis that, that would follow. Um, now, Italy um, didn't have the credit-driven financial crisis that Ireland and Spain had, but what it had was a, a debt-driven, government debt-driven financial crisis, um, the sort of debt crisis. And Italy is still saddled with, with huge amounts of, of government debt, um, which is you know one of the one of the danger points um, that Eurozone faces in, in, in this very uncertain world that, that we're in now. Um, so you know having a common energy policy um, for Italy is is a bit that can be a bit of a problem. I'm not sure it's a problem at the moment um, because the you know some big lessons have been learned as a result of the sovereign debt crisis, and the, the European Central Bank is now standing by to potentially provide liquidity support and uh, to buy more Italian debt if if the stresses, um, if, if the differences, if the spreads between German and Italian um, sovereign bonds uh, is rise too much, I think ECB would stand by to. To deal with that, so you know, it's being handled. Um, but, but obviously, the, the impact of, of inflation and interest rate changes is going to be rather different on Italy than, than in other countries. And probably the sector, you know, in Italy probably bears more heavily on, on firms rather than on households. It's households relatively low debt. Um, anyway, so that's the kind of thing that you need to think about. When, when thinking about the situation in Italy in the, the current policy context.